This is the mic test, mic test. Can you please tell me if you hear me okay? Thank you so much. Kindly respond to the poll. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good day to all. My name is Dr. Tom Badayag, and I am your coordinator and faculty for these webinars. These webinars were designed to supplement learning activities offered to you by MedProU. It is the aim of this program to provide you with knowledge and skills, which will prepare you for US nursing practice. Before I start, however, I would like to mention that the images that are projected on your screen has been maximized to ensure the highest quality of resolution. However, if you are using an equipment that is not a computer, like a phone, the images may appear small. There is nothing that I can do on my end to amplify those images. Additionally, some of you have commented in previous webinars that you cannot hear me well. The voice quality and volume is controlled at your end. Please make the necessary adjustments on your devices as the source of the issue is not on my end. Having said that, let's go ahead and get started with care of the patient with a pacemaker with a focus on temporary pacemakers. So the ECG monitor displays a normal ventricular pacemaker rhythm. Is this true or is this false? Okay, 17 of you responded so far, and we're waiting for around five of you to respond. Please participate as much as possible on the poll so that we will be able to assess where you are at this point. 
Okay. All right. So majority of you said that there's a false, and uh, this is a false statement. And this is how you responded. 59% of you said that. And 41% of you did say that this was a normal ventricular pacemaker rhythm. The answer to this is this is an abnormal pacemaker rhythm in the sense that there is a problem that is demonstrated. And the problem that is demonstrated is going to be something that we're going to be discussed later on. But as a general um, statement, I wanted to point out something that we know that the patient has a pacemaker implanted. And the reason for that is because of the presence of pacemaker spikes, a vertical line that indicates the discharge of electrical activity from an artificial source. Okay, so that is going to be the focus of our presentation this morning are some of the problems encountered with pacemakers, particularly uh, temporary pacemakers. So why are we here today and why this topic? While nurses must understand the patient's underlying cardiac rhythm and myocardial function, uh, the degree of device dependency, meaning to say how much the patient depends on the pacemaker, the interpretation of intrinsic or natural pace uh, beats, as well as uh, pace ECG beats, and the patient response to pacing are all important things that we must know as nurses. So I know that some of you are not going to be uh, assigned to the intensive care setting, but nonetheless, you might have or an encounter with patients that do have pacemakers and therefore this particular webinar. So whenever we have a patient with a pacemaker, it's important that there be a shift check between off going as well as incoming nurses to ensure that the pace settings are in accordance to the medical records. So uh, I know that some of you probably have not seen what an external pacemaker looks like, or this is an external pacemaker uh, that is demonstrated over here or illustrated over here. And one of the things that we must ensure is that when we are having a shift check between the outgoing and incoming nurses is that we need to make sure that we know what type of pacemaker is implanted because there are several pacemakers that are in use today. They include your epicardial pacemaker, uh, or it could also include the transthoracic pacemaker, which is only used in an emergency. Uh, there are also other things that we must include in our report and that is what kind of mode is in use. There are um, two basic modes of pacemaker settings, a fixed mode, which means to say that the pacemaker is always going to be working. And the other one is demand. From the very word demand, it describes the fact that the pacemaker only will work when it is necessary or needed. And in addition to that, obviously the nurses must make sure that they discuss about the settings. What is the rate that the pacemaker is set at? That is very, very important. As well as how much output in terms of milliampage or the amount of voltage that is going to be delivered to uh, the patient once the patient demands it. And in addition to that sensitivity, which is going to be a concept that we will discuss, as well as the AV interval, or the interval between one pacing spike to another. So all these things are going to be important in the report process. So we're going to get to another poll and uh, Let's see.
If a patient has a well-functioning demand pacemaker that is set at 80, is it possible for the patient's heart rate to be 75 per minute, true or false? So which means to say that if a patient, you get a report and you, uh, the report says that the patient has a demand pacemaker set at 80, and now you assess the patient and the pulse rate is 75, is this okay or not okay? This is exactly what the question is asking, okay? All right, so let's see how you responded. I'm going to share the results. And 55% uh, of you indicated that this is a true statement. And 45% of you indicated that this is a false statement. So let's go ahead and discuss this. Well, if a patient's pacemaker is set at 80, that means to say that you should never have a pulse rate less than 80 beats per minute. Let me repeat that. If a patient's pacemaker is set at 80, it is always going to be a, an abnormality if you have a pulse rate that's going to be less than 80, okay? Because this is a demand pacemaker. It says that anytime the patient's heart rate drops to below 80, the, uh, the pacemaker is going to be activated, okay? So for those of you who missed this question, please remember that, that once a patient's pacemaker is set at a certain rate, you should never get a pulse rate that's less than that, okay? So in this particular picture, I wanted to point out something. How do you find out the rate? This is where you find the rate. It's set at 80. And therefore, once you see this, you should never have a pulse rate that's less than 80, okay? All right, so let's move forward and talk a little bit about the monitoring and care responsibilities of nurses once you have a temporary pacemaker. At least every one to four hours, depending on the patient's stability, the following check should be performed as well as documented. The ECG monitoring would indicate how dependent this patient is on the pacemaker. You're also going to evaluate the uh, capture as well as sensing functionings of the pacemaker, which will be a focus of our discussion next. Of course, vital signs, the actual pacemaker activity as well as complications are going to be part of your assessment and monitoring. In addition to that, battery check or assessing the pacemaker site are also important uh, parameters that you would have to monitor. Make sure that if a patient has an arterial line, that you monitor the heart rate uh, from the arterial waveform. So if there is no A line, it is recommended that whenever you have a temporary pacemaker, that you connect the patient to a pulse oximetry. Why is that? Because not all electrical activities necessarily result in a pulse. A pulse. Let me repeat that. Just because you see QRS complexes on the monitor, does not necessarily mean to say that there is going to be a palpable pulse. There are situations which we call pulseless electrical activity, which might result, therefore, in problems associated with perfusion. And that is the reason why, just because a patient has a 
face maker or a QRS complex displayed on the screen doesn't mean necessarily that the patient has a pulse rate, okay? All right, so let's move on. Now, some of you might be assigned to open heart surgery. Uh, a majority of you are not going to be assigned to open heart surgery, uh, but in post open heart, sometimes we see things like this that I am pointing out over here. These are epicardial pacing wires. And these are going to be uh, wires attached to the right atrium, which are going to be brought out on the right side of the sternum. And those from the right ventricle are going to be ones that are coming out on the left side of the chest. So whenever we have a epicardial pacemaker, we should always make sure that we um, handle this with non-conductive gloves because by holding these particular wires, which are directly connected to the heart, you might have the possibility of transmitting micro shocks to the heart, which could precipitate ventricular fibrillation. So we should always make sure that we protect this and that uh, with um, insulation, I should say, and we should always handle it with non-conductive gloves, okay? All right, moving further with the monitoring and care of the patient, we should always make sure that we look at the electrocardiogram and what are we looking at in the electrocardiogram? Well, we're looking at inappropriate pacing or sensing activity. And as I said, there could be electromechanical dissociation, meaning to say that there might be a QRS complex displayed on the monitor, but it might not be causing a pulse. And thus, it is important that we do not assume that just because the monitor shows QRS complexes, that it is causing the pulses of pulse activity as well. And because of the fact that the, um, the cables that delivers electrical current to the heart might be displaced or it might be coated by fibrin products, we're always going to make sure that we look at possibilities of the deterioration of the pacing threshold. So you're going to see a blank screen on, on your screen, a white screen, and that's because I'm going to write something and illustrate, okay? So the thing that I'm going to uh, talk about is that whenever we have Just hold on one moment while I, okay. Now, supposing now that this is the, the heart right here, in order to deliver electrical current, there has got to be an electrode that goes into the heart, okay? And this particular electrodes are going to be the ones that are going to deliver the electrical current from the source that is outside of the heart. Now, whenever a patient is having this procedure done, this particular electrode usually is going to be anchored in muscles uh, that are called trabeculi carne. So if, I don't know if you, ever dissected a heart, a pig's heart or a human heart, but in the endocardium, you will see muscles uh, like this. They're interdigitated and these are called trabeculi carne. And so when we insert the electrodes, the objective is for the electrode to land in this trabeculi carne so that it will not migrate, okay? 
Now, however, in some instances, what's going to happen is that this electrode might migrate to here. And therefore, it will have a difficult time going to muscles to stimulate it. And thus, it will not cause a cardiac contraction. So this is what we call a migration of the electrode. And therefore, when there is going to be migration, the amount of electricity that was once enough to cause cardiac contraction is no longer enough. Okay, let me repeat that because some of you might have um, been confused. Okay, so let me draw a heart. I mean, let's say now that this is the right ventricle. An electrode is inserted and the insertion of the electrode hopefully lands into a area called the trabeculi carnae. Okay, so if we were delivering five millivolts because these are directly in the muscles, it is going to cause contraction. But let's say that during the residency of this particular electrode, the electrode migrates into the center of the endocardium. So it's no longer near muscles. So even if you give five millivolts right over here, what's going to happen? It's going to have to travel to the walls of the ventricles in order to stimulate it. So therefore, once it reaches these muscles, it is no longer five millivolts. It will therefore decrease the amount of electricity that eventually reaches the walls of the muscles, and therefore the muscle might not contract. Okay, so to illustrate the point again, Supposing that you are standing over here, okay, and I put an electrical current right next to you, will you get electrocuted? Will you get electrocuted? Yes, right? But supposing now that you are standing over here and the electrical current is right over here. Well, in order for you to get electrocuted, there has got to be a contact between you and this electrical source. So it's most likely that you're not going to be electrocuted. So similarly, when we have a patient who has a temporary pacemaker, and now the electrode uh, migrates from the wall right over here of the right ventricle, it now moves over here, what's going to happen? You're not going to have an adequate response to this electrical stimuli. So this is what we call the deterioration of the pacing threshold. So that is always going to be important that you monitor that every spike that you see must be followed by either a QRS complex in the case of a ventricular pacemaker or a P wave in the case of an atrial pacemaker. Okay. All right. We also would want to um, make sure that we look at the settings and I'm going to bypass this particular slide in order to emphasize the point of what we're looking at whenever we're monitoring the patient's electrocardiogram. So whenever you're looking at an electrocardiogram, what one thing that you need to make sure that you do is to monitor for pacemaker malfunction. And the first pacemaker malfunction that we're going to talk about is going to be failure to output, also known as failure to fire, 
or failure of pulse generation. Okay. So in this particular slide, do you see the evidence of a pacemaker? Do you see an evidence of a pacemaker? Yes or no? Is there a pacemaker? Only Eunice responded. All right. So if we look at this particular slide, we're going to see that there is evidence of a pacemaker. Why do we claim that? We claim that because these are vertical lines right over here. And therefore, the presence of a vertical line, a straight vertical line, is an indication that an electrical energy has been delivered to the heart by an artificial source. Okay? So, again, the reason that we know that a pacemaker is present is that there is a vertical line right over here. This is a vertical line that is present in the ECG. Okay. Now, is the delivery of the pacemaker or the electricity consistent? In this particular, um, what do you call that? In this particular example, is the delivery of the electricity consistent? Okay, so the pacemaker is firing at this interval. And notice that there's nothing that occurred right over here. It should have fired over on this particular area. So what this means to say, therefore, is that the pacemaker has not fired and it should. This is what's known as failure to output. Do you remember what I said that if a pacemaker is set at 80, you should never have a pulse rate less than 80? Well, this is exactly what is happening over here. If you have a pacemaker uh, and the heart rate is going to be less than what it is um, set at, then that means to say that there is a problem. And that problem is going to be called a failure to output or a failure to fire. So this is a failure of the pacemaker to deliver an electrical stimuli at its programmed rate. Okay. Let me just mute everyone. Please make sure that you're muted so that you don't um, disturb everyone. So what are the causes of failure to output? Well, the number one cause of failure to output is this connection from the device. So this is very, very possible that you can actually dislodge the um, the external pacemaker, this one right here, from the electrode itself. And so let me tell you a story to underscore the possibility that this is going to happen. So we had a patient that um, one time had to go for an emergency insertion of a pacemaker because of a complete heart block. And so, uh, you know, in the United States, when we have a pacemaker insertion in an emergency, we do not bring the patient to the cath lab. We do the procedure right at the bedside. And so uh, I remember uh, Sylvia, who was uh, my friend and was working with this patient, asked me to help her 
uh, be, to change the bed of the patient because it was so bloody or messy from the procedure. And so I proceeded to go ahead and help her. But at the at same token, once we were changing the patient's bed, the alarm goes on and uh, goes off, I should say, and it showed a systole. The problem was in the process of changing the bed, what happened was the, the lead disconnected from the pacemaker source, this one. And therefore, there's no more source of electricity. And therefore, this is what is known as failure to output. So when you see a straight line or no longer see a pacing spike, then that means to say that there has been a disconnection. Okay, so the absence of pacemaker spikes, even though the patient's intrinsic rate is less than that of the pacemaker, is a manifestation of failure to output. So in summary, if you have a patient with a pacemaker that is set at 80, and now they have a heart rate of 60, the possibility that the problem is that there is failure to output. So what's the solution? The solution is to make sure that the connection to the electrodes from the power source is going to be intact. All right, so here are the causes. The causes are battery failure. That's also a possibility. There could be a fracture of the pacing wire or a displacement of the electrode tip. There could be a problem with the pulse generator itself, or perhaps it could be other situations such as a broken or loose connection, electromagnetic interference, and sensing problems. Since electromagnetic interference is a potential problem in malfunctions of pacemakers, it is imperative, therefore, that we avoid or we do not allow for telephones like cell phones to be used in patients that have a temporary pacemaker. Okay, are there any questions as far as failure to output is concerned? No? Okay. So let's go to another problem. And the other problem is what is known as failure to capture. Failure to capture is a situation wherein the pacemaker delivers a pacing stimuli, but the electrical stimulation does not occur. So in other words, there is a pacing spike, that, but nothing occurs after the pacing spike. Okay, so in looking at this example right over here, we have a pacemaker. What type of pacemaker do we have over here? What type of pacemaker do we have based on the electrocardiogram? Is it an atrial or a ventricular pacemaker? Can you please respond in the chat? It's a ventricular pacemaker. And the reason we know that it's a ventricular pacemaker is because the pacing spike is followed by a QRS complex, okay? Now, we see that this pacing spike caused a QRS complex, that's good. This pacing spike caused a QRS complex, that's also good. And we have a pacing spike here with nothing at all. This is not good. This means to say that the pacemaker fired, but despite the pacemaker firing, there is not an appropriate response from the heart muscles. And therefore, this is what's known 
as failure to capture. So again, in failure to capture, the pacemaker delivers a pacing stimuli, but the electrical stimulation does not occur. All right, so how is that manifested? We will have a pacing spike without any corresponding complex that follows it. All right, so there are several causes of the failure to capture, and I'd like to focus on the, um, I'm gonna zoom in over here, on the possible causes and the interventions for failure to capture. Well, the problem might be as a result of a lead problem, like a fracture of the lead, for example. And the way in which we could verify its presence is by doing a chest X-ray, okay? So once you identify this problem, you're going to request for a chest X-ray so that you can determine if in fact it is caused by a fracture of the leads. And what do we mean by lead fracture? Okay, so let's illustrate that again. Now, as we had said, whenever we have this generator here, connects to the heart by way of a pacing lead. So this is the way in which electrical current is going to be delivered into the heart. But let's say now that you fracture this, you break it, what's going to happen? Obviously the electrical current could therefore not be delivered adequately to the heart. And therefore what's going to happen is you're going to have a loss of capture pacing spikes without any corresponding response. The other thing is that there might not be enough electricity that you're giving. And therefore, what you're going to have to do is to make sure that you find out why is it that the amount of voltage that is being delivered is not going to be adequate. Is the cost because of medications? Is the cause because of electrolyte problems or is the cause other um, factors that might be contributing to the um, decreasing of the pacing threshold? So what does that mean? Supposing now that you are driving and you're driving like here on a flat line, but all of a sudden you up, go up a hill. Now, will it require for you to adjust the amount of gas in order to go up over here? Yes or no? Will you need to put more gas or press on the gas pedal more as you go uphill? Okay. So, Hold on to that particular concept. We're now going to relate that to the heart. So supposing now that this is the electrode and now this is the muscle, because the electrode is a foreign body, fibrin products might coat it. So if you coat this particular electrode right over here, would you require more electricity to come out? Yes or no? Or I'll change my question. Supposing now that I'm delivering five millivolts right over here. Let me just redraw that. So let's say that you are delivering five millivolts right over here, okay? Now, the situation is that now your electrodes are going to be coated. 
over here, the amount of electrical current that will go to the muscles is going to be five millivolts, correct? But when you coat this electrode right over here, will the amount of current still be five millivolts going into the muscles? When you coat it, no, okay. So therefore, what you're going to have to do is you need more electricity in order to penetrate these coatings over here to stimulate the heart rate or uh, the heart. So this is what is known as the um, the threshold being changed. Okay. So this requires more electricity in order to cause a particular response by the heart. So that's why scar tissue at the electrode tip right over here is the cause of this particular problem. So whenever we have this situation, what's going to happen is we're going to increase the voltage right here. So this is where we're going to increase the voltage. Now you might be asking, are the nurses allowed to um, touch this? And the answer is yes and no, okay? In medical centers where you have an intensivist or a physician that's going to be present in the ICU all the time, the intensivist will actually be the one to do this. But if you work in a community hospital, when I say community hospital, it might be a 300 bed hospital, 250 bed hospital, and they usually do not have intensivists working with you in the ICU, nurses are going to have to do this. And that is the reason why I'm pointing this out to you in this discussion, because there's going to be a, um, what do you call that? No time for you to wait for the physician to come, all right? So when you have a loss of capture and it occurs frequently, what you're going to have to do is to increase the milliamperage or the voltage that is going to be delivered to the patient, all right? So different parts may require different amounts of energy to elicit a response. And so, you know, we're going to have to have the ability to adjust this. And so whenever you have this particular situation, you might have to increase the milliamperage. And so you're going to change it this way. And this is the amount of electrical energy that is going to be delivered to the myocardium. And by turning the dial to a higher number, you are going to increase the milliamperage. The higher the milliamperage, the more energy that is going to be generated by the device. And therefore, this is going to be an intervention for patients with loss of capture. Okay? Are there any questions as far as loss of capture is concerned? Any questions as far as loss of capture is concerned? So the major manifestation of loss of capture is if you see a spike with no, cor with no corresponding depolarization wave, then it is going to be loss of capture. Yes, Edwin, go ahead and erase your question. You could either type it or unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, so... Uh, Lucas is asking, what's the recommended voltage for pacing? All right, we do not want to fry the heart, okay? So we have a test called the, uh, the, the threshold, the pacing threshold. 
So what we do is this, we start with the lowest setting, let's say 0.1 and watch the monitor. If the monitor, monitor does not show any waveform of depolarization, then that means to say that that electricity is not going to be sufficient, okay? So we increase it to let's say 0.5 and still there's not going to be a wave of depolarization. So that means to say that it is not sufficient. Then we turn it up again, another notch. And let's say now that we turn it to one milli milliamps or millivolts. And now we see a wave of depolarization. That is what's called the basing threshold. And so we usually set it twice to your pacing threshold to make sure that it's going to be consistent. So we're going to set it therefore to two. Did you understand that? Um, did I make that clear or was that muddy? So let's say now that I start with 0.5. Okay? And there is nothing that happens in the ECG to indicate a wave of depolarization. So I now go to uh, uh, the next step, I go to one. And let's say now that by putting it to one millivolts, you now see a wave of depolarization. This is what is known as the threshold. And so in order to be safe, we always set it to twice the threshold. So we're going to set it to two millivolts, okay? So I hope that answers the question of uh, Lucas. All right, so let's now go to the question of Edwin on managing a patient with loss of culture. Are nurses allowed to turn the patient in case of lead displacement to increase contact of the lead to the trabeculi carne? Exactly, okay. So. That is exactly one of the interventions that you're going to do whenever you are going to have a failure to capture is to turn the patient to the side. If you turn the patient to the left side, for example, there is a possibility that there's going to be adherence to the endocardium. So let's go back to Edwin's um, point right over here. So again, if this were the heart, and now the lead placement is supposed to be contacting the muscles, remember the muscle wall, uh, this is going to be the normal fashion in which electricity is going to cause a wave of depolarization. But let's say now, because the patient moved quite a whole lot, or you moved the patient quite a whole lot, the lead now migrates to the center of the chamber. So therefore, what's going to happen is despite the fact that you have enough electricity, it's too far away from the walls of the muscles to be able to have a response. And so what Edwin is saying is that an intervention for loss of capture is to turn the patient to the side. If you turn the patient to the side, it is hoped that this particular lead is now going to go back to the walls of the endocardium and therefore will rectify the situation. Thank you, Edwin. That's a good question. Okay. All right. The next type of problem that we're going to have to be aware of whenever we have pacemakers is what is known as failure to capture. Okay. Before we go to, I mean, failure to sense, I'm sorry. But before we go to failure to sense, remember now that we have failure to output. When you have failure to output, 
the pacemaker, there's no more pacemaker spikes that are going to be observed, okay? So the absence of pacemaker spikes when it is required is what is known as failure to output. The second problem that we discuss is failure to capture. Remember now that failure to capture is manifested in the electrocardiogram by spikes that are not followed by a wave of depolarization, either a QRS in the event that there is a ventricular pacemaker or a P wave in the case of an atrial pacemaker. So the next thing now that we're going to talk about is failure to sense. So uh, there is a, um, a problem right over here. It should be failure to sense. I'm sorry about that. And failure to sense are of two kinds, under sensing or over sensing. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So what is this failure to sense? Failure to sense is when the pacemaker does not sense the myocardial activity and therefore fires inappropriately. So let's say that we have a demand pacemaker and if the heart is beating like this, the pacemaker is not going to fire. Why is it not going to fire? Because it detects that there is a regular beating of the heart. But let's say now that there is a situation wherein the heart stops beating, the pacemaker should fire. That means to say that the pacemaker sensed or detected the need to fire. That is proper sensing. However, in some instances, there is a failure to sense. So let's take a look at this example over here. There's a natural beat right over here and a natural beat right over here. And obviously, because there is a natural beat, there is no need for the pacemaker to fire at all. So again, there is a natural beat right over here, or a native beat, also known as an inherent beat. There shouldn't be a pacemaker firing at all. And now, uh, let me just bring back my caliper. As you could notice, right over here, it should be having a natural beat right over here, but there's none, okay? And that is because of the fact that this pacemaker activity occurred over here. Was this pacemaker activity over here appropriate? Was this pacemaker activity here appropriate? Hello? Should the pacemaker fire over here? Did I lose contact with everyone? <laughs> oh. Okay, no. All right, it's too early. Because if the pacemaker is working well, it should have fired over here if there's no... QRS complex right over in this area, okay? So that means to say then that the problem here is it didn't detect or it didn't sense this normal activity. It didn't sense this QRS complex and therefore it fired. Not sensing means to say that you are under sensing. So let's talk about sensitivity. Sensitivity refers to the pacing device's ability to see what the electrical activity is being generated 
by the patient's own heart to prevent the competition between the heart's intrinsic activity. So let's analogize a sensing to a fence. So let's say now that you have a neighbor and you want to see the neighbor doing everything. Do you want the fence to be high or do you want to have the sense low, the fence low? If you are nosy and you want to see all the uh, activities of your neighbor, would you want the, the fence to be high or you want the fence to be low? Great, okay. So in order to sense it, you want it to be low, right? But if you don't want to sense it, you want the fence to be high. Okay, so why am I uh, saying this? I am saying this because in some instances, so let's say now that you have a P wave and a QRS complex, and you wanted to detect only the QRS complex, what would happen? Let me just change my color over here. What would happen if my fence is right over here? Will I be detecting only the QRS complex or will I also be detecting the P wave? If my fence is too low, what am I going to see? Is it the P wave or the QRS or both? Both, correct? So what we want is if we only want to detect the QRS, we should put the fence higher, right? By putting the fence higher, what's going to happen is we're only going to detect the activity of the QRS complex, right? So in practical sense, therefore, the lower the setting, the more sensitive the pacemaker is. Let me repeat that. The lower the fence, the more sensitive the pacemaker becomes. So this is what is called sensing ability. So the problem with sensing is either you are over sensing, which means to say that you're fence is too low, or under sensing, which means to say that your fence is too high, okay? So if you put your fence right over here, you will no longer see the QRS at all either. So when we set the sensing mechanism, this is what the button looks like, the sensitivity button. It is... Uh, set in millivolts, it controls the ability of the generator to sense intrinsic activity. So turning the dial to a low number increases your sensitivity. Turning it to a higher number decreases the sensitivity. Let's put that in practical terms because it probably is going to, um, what do you call that, uh, had, had confused you. So let's go to uh, this one. Is this a problem of under-sensing or is it a problem of over-sensing? Is this a problem of over-sensing or is it a problem of under-sensing? Edwin and Rachel are correct, and Okaba, very good. That means to say that we did not sense this particular QRS complex. 
So would you turn the sensitivity button up or down? Would you turn the sensitivity button up or down? Okay, so you remember it's under sensing. Um, and as uh, we said over here, turning the dial to a low number increases the sensitivity. Turning the dial to a higher number decreases the sensitivity. So if it was under sensing was our problem, what do we have to do? Do we turn the dial up or down? Okay, good. All right. So whenever we have under sensing, the pacemaker does not see the inherent activity and it fires earlier than it should. And so the causes might be that the sensitivity is set too low. So therefore, we need to increase the sensitivity by turning the sensitivity dial on the generator clockwise to a lower number. There are other causes like the pacing catheter might be out of position or maybe lying on a dead area, or maybe the pacemaker is set in a wrong mode. So those are the interventions for under sensing. There's also, however, a problem that is opposite and that would be oversensing. Whenever you oversense, that means to say that the pacemaker is too sensitive. It sees too much. It senses wrong signals like the P waves, for example, and therefore causes the pacemaker to fire later than it should. So in oversensing, it is going to fire later than it should. So the causes inter interventions might be that there's an inappropriate um, setting in the box. The sensitivity might have been set too high. And therefore, what we need to do is to decrease the dial to a higher number. Okay. So if it's over-sensing, you want to turn the sensitivity button to a higher number. You want the fence to be higher. So this is a little bit confusing because it is always the opposite. Okay. So let's now take a look at the manifestations of these uh, later on. But before we do that, I'd like to do a, um, a five minute um, a five minute uh, break. So let's go on a break. Um, hold on one moment. Okay, let's go on a five minute break and then come back uh, to continue.
Okay, we have a question from Lucas. Can we defibrillate a patient with a pacemaker? And the answer to that is definitely. Actually, we could also use the, the pacemaker to um, override whatever um, is present. Like for example, if we have, let's say an SVT uh, or a VTAC uh, without a pulse and we need to defibrillate the patient, an option is actually to increase the, um, the heart rate that is being delivered on the pacemaker. And this will compete with the tachycardia that is going to be present. Uh, let me just um, come back over here so that we could, um, hold on one moment. We could discuss this much better. All right, let's see. Just one moment. There you go. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what I was trying to say with Lucas's question was, can we defibrillate a patient with a pacemaker? And the answer to that is definitely. But let's say uh, I wanted to um, talk about override a little bit. So let's say now that you have a patient with a tachycardia with a rate of 210. Now, if you could override this, meaning to say that, let's say I have an artificial pacemaker and I'm going to set the rate at 250, this is going to be nullified. So it's almost like defibrillating the patient. This is what we call an override. And so when patients have a pacemaker, and sometimes depending on what the arrhythmia is, we could actually use the pacemaker to override or so to speak, defibrillate the patient. But yes, to answer your question, Lucas, you can always defibrillate a patient with a pacemaker. All right? Okay. So let's go to another area that I wanted to talk a little bit is the fact that whenever you have an external pacemaker, let's say you have a permanent pacemaker, it is always imperative that you have a magnet available. And what is this magnet for? A lot of times uh, people work in the intensive care unit or the coronary care unit, and they always have a magnet and they always wonder what this magnet is for. This magnet is going to be very important because if you wanted to stop a pacemaker from firing or disable the sensing, I should say, ability of the pacemaker, and you want the pacemaker to fire constantly, what you could do is to put the magnet on top of the internal pacemaker. And what this does is it changes the mode to a DOO, meaning to say that it's going to fire continuously or asynchronously. So what happens whenever um, um, you have a, a pacemaker and an ICD, sometimes we also have to have this because what's going to happen when you put the patient on the operating room table and you are using cautery, the pacemaker detects this as an arrhythmia. And therefore, if you have an internal uh, cardioverter defibrillator, what's going to happen is it might fire inappropriately. So you want to stop the sensing of this particular 
um, electrical interference from the cautery, and that is why uh, we have to have it. So whenever you um, have a magnet also, it is useful for patients who have an ICD, and the problem is that the, the patient is experiencing shocks all the time or inappropriately, you could put the magnet on top of the uh, implanted ICD, and it does not therefore shock, nor does it sense, okay? So right here. All right, do we understand now why a, a magnet is always going to be present in patients with uh, internal or implanted pacemakers and ICDs? Okay, let's move on to exercises. And what I'd like to do is to ask you to participate in here. And let's see, slide 24, we're going to, all right. So we're going to find out what your interpretation of the problem is. So we have an ECG strip here with a pacemaker. Is the pacemaker working well? Is it, there's loss of capture? There's under sensing or is it over sensing? All right, only four of you are participating, eight. Okay, so let's see. This is how you responded, which is very good. I'm, I'm thankful. And so the first observation that we have is we have pacing spikes right over here, which indicates that there is a ventricular pacemaker because the pacing spike is followed by a QRS complex. But then following this observation, we see a spike over here with the arrow that does not have a corresponding QRS complex to follow. And therefore, this is the manifestation that the muscles of the heart did not respond. And this is what we call loss of capture. So the correct answer here is letter B, loss of capture. The manifestation of loss of capture is whenever you have a pacing spike that does not or is not followed, by a depolarization wave, either a QRS or a P wave, okay? So this is a loss of capture. Great, so let's go to another one. All right, your responses. Okay, while you're contemplating on your response, I wanna make sure that you know that these are the pacing beats or the pace beats because it's preceded by this spike right over here. This is a natural or a native beat. All right, I'll give you a few more seconds to respond. Okay. 
Okay, we're going to end the poll. And unfortunately, this is how you responded. And I say, unfortunately, for some reason, okay? The correct answer is it's normal. So let's say, see why it's normal. All right, so the pacemaker is working well right over here. It's working well right over here. These are pace speed. It's working well over here. And because we have a natural beat right over here, obviously it's not going to fire, okay? So the pacemaker work again over here. It work again over here. And then there's a natural beat over here. And obviously the pacemaker should not fire. So in this particular instance, the pacemaker is respecting the presence of natural beats and therefore withholding any pacing activity in the presence of inherent or natural beats. So this is a normal response of the pacemaker. Okay, let's move further. Okay, this is how you responded. Let's see. All right, 8% said normal, 83% said under sensing. And so let's see what the correct answer is. All right, so we have natural beats right over here, a natural beat again right over here, a natural beat over here, and then it fired. It fired early. It should have fired later if necessary. So whenever you have a firing that is early, this is what is known as under sensing. It did not sense the presence of this. Um, my pointer is gone. Uh, of this inherent beat right over here, okay? So it didn't sense this activity, and that is the reason why it fired early. This is what's called under sensing. So whenever it fires earlier than it should, it is called under sensing. Okay, let's move on. And let's see what your response is to this one. I'm just illustrating this for you. Okay, so the correct answer here is, well, let's see. Uh, let me share with you first the results. Uh, a lot of you said over sensing. The correct answer actually is 
this is a normally working pacemaker. And the reason why it's normal is because it respects the presence of inherent beats. So we have an inherent beat right over here and it fired right over here because it was too long. Then we have a pace beat. We have a natural beat and it was sent. So it was only going to fire right over here. So this is a normal uh, ECG pattern for a patient with a pacemaker. Okay, it's working well. Let's go to the next one. Okay, this is how you responded. And now we're going to see what the correct answer is. All right, so we have a ventricular pacemaker right over here and it's pacing well. And we have pacing spikes without any corresponding depolarization wave. Thus, we said that this is going to be loss of capture. Okay, so whenever you have a spike that is not followed by a depolarization wave, then we have loss of capture. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Okay, so a lot of you said that this is loss of capture. So let's take a look at it. We do have a pacing spike, but there is no corresponding wave of depolarization at all. So this is loss of capture. And it might be a um, as a result of the patient um, having a, um, what do you call that? a non-viable tissue to simulate. So the patient is dead, okay? So this is a systole as a result of loss of capture. All right, let's take a look at this one. So whenever you have an ECG strip for pacemakers, make sure that you identify which ones are normal beats and which ones are pace beats so that you will know if there is a problem. All right, thank you for participating. This is how you uh, responded. Majority of you said that it was a uh, normal one. And in fact, that is the correct response. Okay, so let's analyze. Um, okay, so we have an 
a normal beat right over here, a normal beat right over here, or a natural beat, a normal beat, and a normal beat as well. It's actually a PVC, but still it's coming from the heart itself. It's not electrically um, stimulated. This is also another PVC. So these are also inherent beats. And then the pacemaker comes over here. It comes appropriately or it fires appropriately. And therefore, this is an illustration of a normally, uh, a normally functioning external pacemaker. Okay. All right. So let's. Do one more. Okay, before you, uh, if you want to change your answer, this is a natural beat. This is a pacemaker beat. Pacemaker beat, pacemaker beat, a pacemaker beat, a natural beat, and then a pacing spike. If the pacing spike appears early, then it should, then it's under sensing, correct? If it is late, then it's over sensing. Okay, let's share the results. Unfortunately, only one of you got this correctly. This is an illustration of under sensing. So why under sensing? Notice that there is a pacing spike right here, which is too early. And the reason is it didn't sense this natural beat. It happened here again, it didn't sense this natural beat. So the correct answer is under sensing. All right, a lot of you who were uh, doing the answers, your responses to the chat all uh, we're correct, Molly and uh, the one with the iPhone. Okay, great. So let's go to the next one. And the last one. Again, if the spike is earlier, then that is under sensing. If it is late, it is over sensing. Okay, this is how you responded. <clears throat> and let's see. 
you have a pacing spike right over here, pacing spike, pacing spike, pacing spike, it's all good. And then you have a gap over here. And the reason why there's a gap is because this little thing right over here was misinterpreted by the machine or the device as being a QRS complex. This is what is known as oversensing. Oversensing. Okay? Very good, Eunice. All right. And uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we do one more? Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, discuss this. Uh, let's see, let me mute people. Okay. All right, the correct answer is it's failure to capture. So let's let's discuss why it's failure to capture. So we have a pacing spike over here with capture, a pacing spike with capture and another pacing spike without any capture. So this is failure to capture. Some of you might have misinterpreted this as being a QRS complex, but you remember if it is a QRS complex, there should be a T wave. This is actually a pacing spike, okay? And therefore it's a failure to capture. All right. And I said that it was going to be the last, but this is going to be the last. Okay, and most of you, 91% of you said that this was a normal um, pacemaker strip, and it is normal, okay? And let's see, before we go to our, um, <clears throat> our quiz, I wanted to find out how confident are you in interpreting pacemaker rhythms? All right, there's only 12 of you who responded so far, 13 out of 30. All right, we did not do too bad. Here's how you responded. So, we have a majority of you being confident and somewhat confident, which is actually a good thing. All right. So that ends the presentation, but it doesn't end the webinar because now we're going to have a quiz. We're going to have fun. A lot of you have already uh, actually um, experienced this. And uh, so for those of you who have not, we're going to have a quiz. And the purpose of the quiz is going to 
actually um, evaluate what you have learned, okay? So we're now going to go to what is known as Kahoot. And we're going to play Kahoot. And this is like a quiz. Um, hold on one moment. What happened? There you go. And I'm now going to ask you to take out your phones because you're going to go to kahoot.it and you're going to be asked a um, game pin and you're going to enter what is on the screen, okay? Okay, go to kahoot.it and you're going to enter this 1869870 as a game pin. The purpose of this game is to answer as quickly as possible. Okay. Right, we're waiting for others. If you're unable to join, you could still uh, watch online and respond to the chat. You could still benefit from it, okay? All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so because there are pacing spikes and they're followed by a QRS complex, that means to say that we have a ventricular pacemaker. So let's see who answered the fastest. Mon, Kinus, Michelle, Brian, and Rachel are in the board on the board. Congratulations. <clears throat> Okay, we have a situation here wherein we have loss of capture. And loss of capture could be caused by 
a decrease in the uh, milliamperage or a decline in the battery. So all these things are going to be appropriate, like increasing the milliamperage, turning the patient on the left side and checking the electrolytes. This is not a sensitivity problem and therefore decreasing the sensitivity would be inappropriate. And so let's see, Brian was the one who answered the fastest on this particular round. Congratulations. And let's go to the next one. Okay. So let's see what your answer is. And the correct answer is under sensing and loss of capture. As illustrated over here, there's loss of capture. And over here, right over here is loss of sensing. So it's both problems, okay? And so let's see. Ryan was the fastest one on this one. Congratulations. Right. If it's under sensing, it's always the opposite. The sensitivity is set too high. If it's over sensing, the sensitivity is set too low. So let's see um, who answered that the fastest. Mon, Brian, Nee, Derek, and Michelle. Congratulations. Well, we did not discuss this, but I wanted you to know that if you change the battery while the patient is connected to this device, it actually will continue working for a few seconds. So you have a few seconds to change the battery, all right? So it doesn't mean to say that once you remove the battery that this there's no more electricity that's going to the heart. There will continue to be uh, for a few seconds, all right? So the correct answer here is it's going to be true. And Ryan and me has the highest answer of a streak of three. Congratulations. Okay, when we look at pacemakers, they're usually described by, um, by codes. And the first code or the first letter of the code is what is being paced. And the second one is what's being um, detected or sensed. And the last letter is going to be the mode. So what's being paced over here and what's being sensed is the atria. And the I stands for inhibited. Okay, so a lot of you got this correctly. And Brian, Mon, Ni, nee, Rachel, and Michelle are the fastest. Congratulations.
Okay, the pacemaker will continue to fire. So it's gonna be in a synchronous mode. And so let's see. Brian, I mean, Juan, Brian, Rachel, Michelle, and me with April having the highest streak. Congratulations. Okay, this is so very important for nurses in the emergency room. You know, sometimes your patients might come with uh, an AICD and they complain of the AICD defibrillating them all the time. And so whenever you put a magnet over the device right over here, the device will stop defibrillating. Okay, let's see. Brian, Mon, me, Derek, and Rachel answered them quickly. Congratulations. Okay, the problem here is it is failure to output. As you could see, there are no pacing spikes at all. So maybe it's a disconnecting problem. And Brian, Mon, me, Derek, Michelle, Derek has the highest answer streak. And the last one. All right, so we always have to use gloves whenever we're handling these electrodes because we could cause microelectrocution because these leads are going to be directly into the heart. Okay, so the fastest one or the third honor is Derek. Congratulations, Derek. Second fastest is me. And the fastest one in this quiz is Ryan. And we also want to recognize runners up Michelle and Mark. Congratulations. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of this webinar and this presentation. I hope that we have met the objectives. I will be online for the next 30 minutes or 20 minutes to answer any questions that you might have. Remember that the video of the recording of this particular webinar will be uploaded onto Canvas and the PowerPoint presentation used in this webinar will also be in Canvas. You will be receiving a link to evaluating this particular webinar. Once again, I wanna thank you for your participation. It has been my pleasure to be with you today. Thank you and have a good night, good day, or whatever, wherever you are. Thank you once again. <laughs>